ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Side Business School. I hope you can all hear me. Um, the first thing to say is that uh, I am not Charlotte Cotton. Um, unfortunately, Charlotte uh, can't, can't make it today. And uh, my name is Michael Stanley. I'm the director of uh, Modern Art Oxford. And thrilled and delighted to be introducing and, and chairing uh, this first uh, inaugural symposia um, on the work of Thomas Struth and particularly um, ideas around cultural difference and identity that comes through Thomas's work. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce Thomas to my right here, who um, many of you have been in the audience on Monday and I'm sure fully familiar with his practice, which has been really at the leading edge of contemporary photography over the last 20, 30 years, um, with numerous uh, exhibitions and uh, pleased and delighted that uh, he'll be presented here at the Whitechapel Gallery um, in a few weeks' time, I believe it or not, an exhibition, um, which as well, um, James Lingwood, also to my right, has been um, part of and, and contributed to. Um, Thomas is, is the first of the inaugural um, visiting professor of the Humanities Programme and is hosted at um, Magdalen College. And uh, we're thrilled that over this week um, he's contributed to both debates, dialogues, lectures through the Ruskin Art School and uh, also through Modern Art Oxford uh, in terms of debate that's taken place in, in the city. Um, a few years ago, there would have been uh, two MoMA directors uh, sat at this table uh, until a, a name change took place. Um, and I'm thrilled to introduce the other MoMA director of a slightly larger organization <laughs> and uh, a slightly older organization. Um, but for the uh, second time in two days, Glenn, i um, thrilled to introduce Glenn Lowry, who, again, as many of you know, um, took over MoMA in 1995 and um, for many years now has um, completely, if you like, um, placed contemporary practice at the heart of that organisation as well. The uh, merger of uh, PS1 with MoMA that took place uh, several years back um, has really kind of altered the landscape and continues to uh, in terms of contemporary practice. And I think that's also uh, evidenced by um, the huge work that uh, MoMA is doing in relation to its programme, particularly its performance work. And uh, Glenn on Monday spoke very much about the recent Marina Abramovich show, which both challenges and pushes forward the very idea of uh, the Contemporary Art Museum today. And uh, finally, honoured to be uh, next to James Lingwood, which is uh, both as a, an artist many years ago and as an early curator, um, completely inspired me uh, with, with so many projects, both um, Rachel White Reed's House, Michael Landy's Breakdown. Um, James has been co-director of Art Angel with Michael Morris since 1991, has of course not only been uh, responsible for so many kind of leading commissions and uh, taking art to places which um, nobody envisaged it would um, get to, um, but also is, continues to show such strong kind of curatorial drive and, and ambition through uh, major survey exhibitions that he's contributed to uh, not least um, Thomas Struth. So uh, welcome all. The format of today is um, this, this afternoon. We, we're speaking for about an hour or so, and um, I've invited all, all the panel just to um, give a short presentation. Both Thomas and uh, James will be showing some images as well. Um, and we'll be touching on uh, this area of um, cultural difference and identity in the work of Thomas. And I believe, Thomas, uh, you will be kicking us off. So thank yeah, you. I Thank you very much for these uh, uh, fantastic introductions. I um, wanted to thank again everybody who is uh, involved in this week here for, you for setting it up and, and for you supporting it. Uh, uh, you were f we had, uh, yeah, f uh, uh, feel privileged you know, that I can be here and it's been a wonderful time. And I enjoyed meeting with the students the last two days, even though maybe some occasions it was a bit tough, but I, but I, but I, I, I enjoy it very much, and uh, and I um, would like to show some some of my photographs, uh, mainly under the aspect of um, um, which you know, didn't maybe matter immediately so much f for me while I was doing them, but in the background uh, it did, and for example. So um, I think uh, whatever you look, uh, whatever you look at, 
uh, I think uh, as, as an artwork, uh, there's always a distance between your own experience and the experience that is condensed in the art, you know, in this, you know, in the other object or the picture. And I, uh, um, for me, it was very, uh, in the beginning of my work, um, somehow essential to, to deal with post-war German environment that I was born into and grew up in, uh, because it seemed to me that the architecture uh, I grew up in it speaks a more honest uh, language and a more direct and uh, uh, other language than the personal narratives of my parents or of other people who who, uh, who grew up uh, through you know, through the war period, and I uh, so I, I I used built architecture and and the urban environment as a kind of um, uh, you know, thoughtful you, 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 uh, transitory uh, exercise for my own, um, yeah, for my own life. In the beginning, I photographed, for example, 300 or 400 streets uh, in Düsseldorf in a very systematic manner. Uh, in the end, there was only one or two pictures survived because they were the, the best pictures. So I, you know, when I show you these pictures, I just ask the question, is that what do you, your own street looks like? Or this? in London in the 77, in Paris, New York. But this is in Wittenberg in Germany in uh, uh, 93. And I was um, specifically interested uh, in the editing of, of these works and these places. I was particularly interested in, in, uh, in how can I say, in, in finding places that would summarize the, 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 how can I say, the identity of the historical identity of this community who, which has built these places. And this is uh, you know, like a small segment of this, is, uh, different houses that, are, that, are, that have different uh, character. Uh, it's almost as if you meet a person, you know, so if you meet a person, like a handsome person or an ugly person, you know, like a person who's sweating, a person who has dandruff, a person who hasn't, uh, has drunk too much whiskey, or, you know, so you, you have a really, uh, like an essential confrontation, you know, with a very specific taste in both political, psychological uh, expression. So these are for, for, for me you know, the single actors in the in, in the play, in the public play. And then you know, turn to to a cityscape. This is a you know, sort of a, a larger. Uh, a conglomerate again of, of different identities. You this or this, both cities, New York and Lima and Peru. And then I did a similar thing with families, because which when I started from from dealing with my own family, here with my my parents, uh, and my uh, brother and sister. So is that what your family is like, or similar to or this? This, or this, and then you know, possible fathers or uncles <coughs> or brothers or grandfathers. <coughs> and when you deal with thinking about history or going to a museum, would you like to, to be in a museum where you have a situation like this? It's very more common uh, <laughs> experience <laughs> today. That's even more common. <coughs> uh, 
and religion or you know, religious beliefs. and uh, 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 geography. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I didn't say in the format is there will be plenty of opportunity for questions at the end. So, um, uh, James. Yeah, I'm gonna stand up. Okay. From there. When, when I was asked to um, participate in this symposium, the invitation was just to come and have a discussion about Thomas Strutt's work. And then we were thrown a slight curveball when we saw the poster of it being something about pictures contributing to identity and cultural difference. So, if I may, please consider that to be implicit in what I'm saying. <laughs> Not explicit. Um, anyway, um, for over 30 years... Um, as we've seen, Thomas Strutt's photographs have described with great precision uh, some of the structures, physical and mental, which different cultures have built for themselves and explored the systems of belief which underpin the never-ending work of construction. In addition to the particular families of his work, streets, families in a home, peoples in museum, there is an underlying inquiry, I think, what forces are at work in making this place the way that it is? What conditions people to believe in what they believe in, to behave the way they behave? What role do images and architectures have in constructing ideologies as shapers of consciousness or instruments of control? What kinds of personal and collective identity are being made and how? Now, given that we've time only for a very brief excursion into Thomas's work rather than a grand tour of what is a phenomenally diverse and complex body of work, uh, I'd like to focus just on um, three or four pictures from two of the families. Um, the first, uh, which really I'm going to use as a visual counterpoint, are these early black and white photographs made in, uh, first in New York in the 1970s, um, which, which foreground how precisely um, Schrute has used the, um, if you might call the natural central perspective of the camera to position the viewer and the viewer's vision. vision. Uh, in all of these photographs, the ones he talked about in Dusseldorf, hundreds he made in Dusseldorf, I think 40 or 50 made in New York, the camera is always placed absolutely centrally uh, in the middle of the road, um, leading, leading the eye down at the vista. And I think it establishes very clearly that um, there's always a double subject in Strutt's work. There's the subject of the place or the people that we're looking at, but there's also the subject of the way we're looking at it. The second family... Uh, I've always kind of had the um, sort of given myself the kind of working title of this group as, as places of worship. Anyway, there are places of, of, uh, of cultural uh, significance um, which Stroop began to work in following his, his, the, the museum photographs uh, which he showed a few. So here's one, uh, a work made in the church of uh, San Zaccaria in Venice with uh, the delicate figure of the Madonna and the naked child, uh, right at the precise centre of the composition, more or less in the place that you can imagine in the street photograph where the eye is being led down, the vista, into the space. Here the eye is led first, firstly towards the uh, Madonna and child. The painting, uh, Giovanni Bellini's Sacra Conversazioni, uh, from 1505, and Strutt's photographs was made almost 500 years later, in 1995. Within the frame, Strutt pictures the coexistence of, of several different kinds of looking, from attention to absorption. There's a couple standing in front of the altarpiece, looking in the same direction as, as we are initially encouraged to look, at the Madonna and child. There are other visitors to the church 
sitting in the pews, all looking in a different direction, looking to something outside of the frame, to the altar, or perhaps someone conducting a service. What are they all doing here? What are they thinking? The intense gaze of the young man in the bottom left of the composition and the absorption of the middle-aged woman behind, behind him suggest their presence in the church is more than casual. Perhaps they've come to find a space for reflection, to ask for divine intervention, or to seek a temporary reprieve from the pressures of daily life. Back momentarily to another street, the Rue Saint-Antoine in Paris. It was after Struck uh, made his series in New York, he began to photograph in several different, different cities in Europe, still retaining the same central perspective, but beginning to play with it, as you can see by this, the two cross lines in the middle of the photograph. And then on to another place of worship, Tiananmen Square in Beijing, a photograph Stroop made in 1997, where he again positions an iconic image as an immediate central point of attention. Then as your eye wanders across the picture, you see many other watchful eyes. Of course, the great leader, the Chinese people, the custodians of communism, the Red Army, a group of visitors, one standing in front of the dragon, or maybe standing in front of Chairman Mao in the frame of the photograph which his, his friend is taking for him. And of course, outside, outside the frame, the photographer himself, patiently waiting for the different elements to fall into place to achieve what Thomas has called uh, wanting to achieve an emblematic picture. Whilst communist China and Christian Europe are obviously culturally divergent in many ways, Strut suggests that the role the image plays in both has not been so different. He only needs to show us one image of Chairman Mao in China, fixed to the wall, protecting the forbidden city, or one icon of the Madonna, or the face of a single young anonymous woman on a huge screen in Times Square in New York that each of these stands for millions and millions of the same image or similar images spread as incessantly and ubiquitously as possible around the system. And whether the people in the square, either Times Square or Tiananmen Square, are paying any attention to the image or not is in a way immaterial. Whatever they are doing as observers or believers, they're somehow within the system. And even if they're looking elsewhere, the image is still watching them. A street scene from the city where Strut studied in the 1970s, Dusseldorf. And I wanted to ask, where does this come from, this desire to picture the way images and ideologies are intimately entangled? On one level, uh, as, as Thomas himself um, alluded to early, I think we can ascribe this to the cultural circumstances of his, his formative years growing up in Germany in the 1960s and 1970s. Elias Canetti warned in uh, the epilogue to his epic study, Crowds and Power, and I quote, respect for the great of the, wor the, great of the world is not easily abandoned, and man's need to worship is limitless. Born in 1954, Strut was and remains part of a generation growing up in a divided Germany that was initially encouraged not to look, not to look back or dig too deep. And the choice for his generation was either to conform again, but this time in a different way, or to ask some of the difficult questions that had remained unasked during their education. His first professor in Dusseldorf, Gerhard Richter, asked, why do we have ideologies at all? Are they an, is an inescapable, necessary part of our being, or a superfluous, troublesome, life-threatening madness? So Schrute learned to think about how a culture builds an idea and an image of itself, to reflect on how the autonomy of the individual is always circumscribed, 
always weighed on by other forces and to think about how people believe and how they doubt and often in our culture do both at the same time. In the great outdoors of the American West, Stroop once more pictures a site of pilgrimage, in a way, secular pilgrimage. This time, the subject of the devoted attention of the travellers is not the image of a leader, but of an iconic rock formation, El Capitan, in Yosemite uh, National Park in California. Symbol, somehow, of the great free expanse of America. Now, it's been an object of fascination, from Carlton Watkins to Ansel Adams and many other photographers, the immense pale face continuing to exert a magnetic pull on the travellers. And what we see down below is cars who've pulled up on either side so the travellers can stop for a few minutes, marvel at the familiar form, perhaps have the pleasure of seeing the image that they knew they were going to see and to take the photograph that they knew that they were going to take a photograph. And I sort of wanted to digress here a little bit by saying that um, I think a lot of Stroot's pictures um, have a proximity to what you might call the commonplace image, to the common image, um, the images that are made by individuals in their millions or reproduced in their millions. But they always adjust that commonplace in subtle and important ways. We can't tell from this image, but, the, but in, a, in a gallery or museum, they're often quite substantial in scale, the works. And it's the play with scale and the configuration of the pictured people within the physical and ideological framework, which often differentiates Struth's pictures from, from, from the millions of others, which are, which are quite similar. So whilst the ordinary photograph of the object or the place generally excludes the passerby, the photographer often impatiently waiting for them to move away so they don't ruin the picture or foreground someone standing in front, Stroot integrates the site and the people. Even if they're comparatively small within the overall picture, the groups of people are nonetheless visible as individuals going about their daily lives, walking, talking, looking, photographing. They exist in their own quotidian time, the time of the present, just as the immense temples and cathedrals towering above them embody historical time, or in the case of El Capitan, geological time. So the photograph of El Capitan is just one more example of Canetti's suggestion that man's need to worship is limitless. As Schrute surveys the relationship between individual and ideology, between everyday experience and the grand narratives of history, he doesn't belittle the anonymous individuals or the ideologies of which they're living part. It's a kind of um, affirmative scepticism in his work, sharing a sense of wonder at the places of worship, the objects of devotion, which different civilizations have built in homage to their gods, secular or spiritual. But through their subtle revelations of the relations between people, places and systems, Schrute's work seems to me to hold belief and doubt in some kind of pictorial equilibrium and shift the subject, which is arguably really ourselves and what we believe in, to a bigger picture. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. <coughs> Glenn, you have no images. <laughs> I, have, I have no images and awe. That was wonderful. <laughs> James and uh, mm. Thomas. First of all, thank you uh, to Norman and Elena Foster for having made uh, the professorship that I've been able to enjoy for the last uh, week possible, and to uh, my hosts at uh, Balliol College and at the University of Oxford. This has been uh, a thoroughly engaging uh, and meaningful experience for me, and it's been shared uh, by being here with Thomas Struth, uh, somebody I admire enormously. Uh, whose work has fascinated me now for many years. And so uh, it's a particular pleasure to be able to ruminate a little bit about Thomas's work and to try and perhaps inflect uh, both some of Thomas's observations and James' observations uh, with my own. The question of cultural identity, of course, is a very complicated one. And uh, without getting caught up in a very um, 
convoluted uh, post-structuralist argument over the ways in which each of us as a receiver of images is defined and artists as the makers of images are defined. I want to suggest a kind of arc to Thomas's interests uh, that I think helps explain the way he, as an artist, but an artist with a very particular uh, position, uh, looks at uh, the world and constructs for us pictures. And I use the word pictures deliberately here because I think over the course of uh, the week and a number of conversations that Thomas and I have had, but also Thomas's uh, public lecture on Monday, defining the distance between an image, that which we look at but perhaps don't think about in a picture uh, as that which we compose thoughtfully and intentionally, and if I can make that distinction between image and picture, between intentionality um, and the lack of intentionality, it seems to me that Thomas approaches his work uh, almost scientifically. Uh, he investigates particular sets of problems. The camera is his instrument, and he is, of course, deeply embedded in a history of photography, but is, in fact, using the camera as a way of exploring the world, of trying to make order and sense out of a variety of problems, many of which both he uh, and James have defined. But what I'd like to suggest is that his uh, journey uh, and it's always dangerous to generalize, but his journey has been a kind of reverse journey from the distance of his architectural, early architectural photographs to the mid-ground of his work uh, in public spaces and especially in cathedra and museums to the foreground of his most recent work. Uh, and in that journey, what I think uh, has happened is a an investigation first of what could be loosely framed as exteriority, that which we see from an external perspective, hence those almost silent uh, architectural scenes that frequently are devoid of traffic, even uh, occasionally of people, that have a stillness to them, that are actually about the built environment in its exterior dimension to the later uh, photographs that take place inside public spaces, a mid-ground uh, that are as much about the people in the space as they are about the space itself. And I think uh, one of the most interesting dimensions of uh, Thomas's work is that the first earliest photographs in public spaces were about people looking at something, looking at art, looking at uh, the architecture of the space. And the later pictures are actually about the people looking. And the actual source of what they are looking at uh, has been uh, removed from us. We are left with the engagement of the uh, individual, whether it is casual or intense, uh, whether they are snapping a picture of something not yet seen, gazing upon something um, miraculous, but that we can only imagine. So if you think of though a, tr a, a, a transition from the distant to the mid-ground, many of the most recent pictures uh, that Thomas has made, especially uh, at the Max Planck Institute, uh, but also uh, Cape Canaveral, they take us inside. They now become the foreground. He's moved from the distant ground to the mid-ground to the foreground. That which is hidden, all of the strange interstices of these uh, atomic uh, uh, reactors and particle accelerators uh, and um, uh, uh, massive rockets that we are used to seeing from the outside, Thomas takes us inside to that which is secretive uh, and hidden. And that move has actually to me is like he keeps changing the magnification of the lens that he looks at the world through to something that was relatively low magnification, so we saw it in its full distance, to an, a mid-magnification which pulls us into the ground at which people um, 
play and exist to an intense magnification that removes people again, but now takes us inside uh, what he is observing. And I think this kind of investigation uh, that looks at the world through different layers of magnification uh, is a way of exploring not only who he as an artist is, the inquirer, the investigator, but who his subjects are. Uh, and that's the part that really interests me, that uh, perhaps it's almost impossible to have looked at post-war Germany in the 1970s, if you were a German, with the same level of magnification that he can return to post-war Germany 30 years later and look at. It's as if he's asking the question, what made this possible? First documenting what was there and then asking what made it possible. And I think that underscores the role that great artists play, not only in the maker of pictures, but in the investigation of how we as humans see and define ourselves. And I think that's the great uh, contribution uh, that Thomas has made. The use, the, 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 the ability to take us on his particular journey through his past in order to understand better not only what he sees as a photographer, but what we as receivers of these pictures might see about those sites that he investigates, whether they are uh, in Germany, in Europe, or in Asia. It's the same query looking to define what the right focal length is in order to understand what's being seen. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I have a tough job now. Um, I wanted to, well, I'll, I'll try and capture <laughs> quite a lot of that and one of the things that has both come through uh, lots of those presentations and, and ideas is a, <coughs> is a conversation both between the construction of the image and and the reception and I was r reminded Thomas of um, the, the Benjamin quote that you used on on Monday that you, you tweaked um, mm -hmm. when you talked about the Benjamin's quotes of the the illiterates of the future will not be the man who cannot read the alphabet but the one who cannot take the photograph. And you very kind of purposefully uh, swapped the take for to read. And I think something which um, has come through all these kind of presentations is that relationship between the taking and the reading, this kind of iterative process that informs um, one another. But kind of coming back a little bit to uh, James's um, uh, kind of area towards the end of his presentation on, on position and your position. And I kind of wanted to ask whether your thoughts and kind of sociologically with the, the advance of technology and the huge proliferation of, of images and the images that James referred to here have been taken every day, probably as we speak now, hundreds of times over, um, whether sociologically that faculty to read an image um, has been superseded by a much stronger desire to take images. Well, uh, uh, I think since we're in the middle of this process, it's, it's uh, difficult to, you know, like maybe in 50 years, people will, will say, yeah, that was around the millennium when, when all this started and we were in the middle of it and, then, and now we see it more, uh, more clearly. Uh, I was always, I, you know, I'm fascinated, which is it may be trivial, but but that's uh, really what fascinates me a lot. If you could take a very far distance, you could say, okay, we are, we live on a planet, yeah, and we are we are very very vulnerable entities, so we we want to survive, like we want to you know, not die soon, and we have you know, we want to survive. Uh, humans are group uh, elements. I mean, we're group, we're herd uh, beings. You know, we're not single uh, entities. And and there's always a kind of struggle between, you know, for example, I w we witnessed all 
you since the 80s, you, so the heyday of privatization is kind of the religion. You know, since since the political movement of the 80s, and uh, and the struggle, for example, when we talked the other night at the dinner about the humanitas, <laughs> that from all the yeah, the budget cuttings, humanitas, humanities is the one that gets <laughs> cut the easiest because it's somehow about how we live together rather than you make a fantastic business degree to get, you know, to be able to make the most profit for yourself as an individual. So that's always a problem and a very intense uh, um, uh, energy. And then that, that all has always fascinated me uh, a lot. The picture making in this is, you know, as is, is, is somehow seems to be to me that the, 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 the digital picture making just allows you know, for very private uh, uh, contact. You know, for example, uh, my wife was in America f all the month of, of April, and I was walking every day, every morning on the Rhine and Düsseldorf with our uh, puppy dog. And so I, I, I took a picture of, of our dog on the Rhine and send it to her on her cell phone so that when she wakes up in the morning she has a, she has a message. <laughs> this is a very private, nice thing you know, which, uh, we have these days, but I think what, 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 what drives me really is a consciousness of what, so what is an image, what is a picture, what is it good for, and, if, and when I make pictures, you think, you think twice before you make a picture why you why you do it and what it means and on what level it functions uh, also. And I think that is a very, very, um, very, uh, it's just very important for me. That has nothing to do with the art world or with being an artist. It's just, it's just, it's just a condition of life. You know, I, 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 when I was younger, when I was 16, 17, I, w I was uh, waiting at the dentist and I went, yeah, I flipped you know, through a yellow press magazine I was just, I could, after 20 minutes, could fall off the chair. It was a major depression, and I, <laughs> and I sort of, I didn't know, yeah, I, I didn't know why. <laughs> it was a, just a strange experience, but this all the embedded the conventions and all this sort of the, the this shady, um, the conflicted intentions that are, in, in the, that I'm so, so bubbling in these, in, in, in these pictures. James, you've kind of written, spoke before about this, um, almost a kind of a, a stillness or a pause mm. that comes through um, Thomas's work, and whether that's itself is a kind of a mechanism for that delay to begin to read the image. I think it's probably what differentiates the, um, the experience of living with a flood of images from um, you know, having a picture which has the capacity to, to hold you um, the one of the aspects of Thomas's work which I don't think has been spoken about which is I think somehow quite interesting is um, when he had an exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum in New York in the huge atrium there were a number of video portraits and those video portraits were simply I can say of, of uh, people sort of holding their gaze at you in as still a way as possible mm. for as long as possible for something like an hour or so, mm. is that right? Um, and, you know, I, I think, um, you know, we live in a kind of grazing, glimpsing world. Uh, we have the capacity to read images with incredible sophistication very, very quickly indeed. Um, but what a picture maker do, does is not just to give us a sequence of stills, you know, which could be tens or now hundreds of stills, but to offer a distillation. Um, I think, or you use the word condensation. Uh, but it's the same kind of thing. It's about um, some sort of concentration, but in a way which I think still honours its, uh, its relationship to the described. Um, quite clearly, Thomas is not one of those photographers who manipulates the image in overt ways. Uh, I think there's a little bit of work going on now, but but basically there's still um, a process of a careful consideration of what's in the frame. 
and trying to keep a kind of accuracy toward you know the, the, the focal points at various at various planes, um, and you know I think it's probably why um, successful picture makers within photography, possibly within painting, still also uh, are so rare now because it's so difficult to gauge you know how you can move from um, just a still to something which has a quality of distilling without it becoming sort of overblown or sort of grandstanding in terms of the statements it wants mm. to make. Mm. Again, you, you spoke um, quite a lot on Monday in regards to Thomas's work in relation to the museum, um, but also, and, and maybe something which James referred to earlier on, as uh, our, our reels as largely being um, the conscience of the reception of the image. Um, but so much of Thomas's work in terms of challenging those boundaries, um, particularly in the museum series. Uh, I just wonder if you want to say a few more words about that in relation to uh, this conversation and the reception and the production. Because so many of those images, particularly, uh, which I think Thomas has shown here, of uh, a, a picture of people looking at pictures, taking pictures of pictures, um, gives another multi-layered facet to this idea of taking reception, production, and that iterative process? No, I think the, the, the fascinating aspect of that body of work um, is that it, it foregrounds very quickly this question of seeing. Uh, because, of course, we see uh, in the museum uh, works the, often the painting or object that's being looked at, uh, but we also see what Thomas has chosen for us within the frame of his camera. Uh, and I, you use the word, James, condensing. I mean, I think of any great photographer as a brilliant editor, uh, not only of the thousands of possible uh, photographs that he uh, or she may have taken and choosing the one that captures best what he or she was after, but of the thousands of possibilities that a camera might actually focus on at any one moment. And I think Thomas is, um, has become, I mean, he always was, but certainly in the museum series, uh, he is seeing for us. And he puts, I think he puts himself in the position of a uh, thoughtful viewer in the museum and asks the question, what would I look at? What could I imagine myself seeing? And how would I see it? And how would I see it? Uh, would I see it alone and quietly? Uh, would I see it jostled by hundreds of people? Uh, would I see it as a reflection of something else I know? Or would I see it afresh with awe and wonder? And in that context, all of the thousands of decisions that we read intuitively, but that actually are part of a very conscious process on Thomas's part, play out the choice of lighting, the choice of the height at which the camera is going to locate itself. Is it going to look at this from the point of view of our eyes? Will it look down? Will it look up? Uh, and because Thomas uses large format photography, the amount of detail uh, that is presented to us is often more than our eye registers when we're actually in that space. Right? And the fact that that picture is frozen for us, uh, as opposed to something that's instantaneous, we can study and learn more about what we were seeing often than when we were there, than we were there ourselves. And this gets back into this whole question of taking, what was it, taking uh, and reading. We all take pictures, and I don't mean snapshots. We take millions of pictures a day with our eyes, uh, but we read very few of them. We read very few, there are very few moments where something is seen, digested, and observed to the point that it's inscribed in our memory. Uh, and I think of a lot of the uh, photographs that Thomas takes as helping us identify what we might want to inscribe in our memory. I'm really conscious of time, and we have about 10 minutes or so, uh, 15 minutes. Um, so I'd like to open this up to the floor and I'm sure uh, lots of questions and, and ideas which can be posed at uh, any of the panel but I imagine Thomas you might be answering 
um, a few. Um, are there any questions from the, from, from the floor? We have one over here. as viewers of your work, looking at the viewers that we see looking but not the object, because having been here on Monday as well and today, I'm struck by how much people always laugh at that moment, as if it's a kind of recognition that the people looking are not people like us, because apparently we, perhaps some of us who laugh, look at art differently than the people who we're laughing at, in the, which seem to be like tourists. But I wondered whether when you make those photographs, it's kind of with the lens of an anthropologist as well, more than a humanist, or how, and how do you respond to audiences kind of laughing along? I mean, I don't think it's disdain, maybe it's embarrassment or it's recognition, but there's definitely some level of difference is created as we apparently don't recognize ourselves as these people taking photographs in museums. Um, well, I don't know what the, uh, uh, the humoristic moment in this uh, comes from. <laughs> I, uh, um, well, I, I suspect partly is a self, is a self, your recognition of of, of the, your, own, your own activity. Uh, certainly, I, um, um, I, uh, uh, I must say, with, with the exception of the, the the later photographs that show only the people, the, the museum visitors, and not the artworks. Uh, in, the, in the beginning, my main concern was to remind people, uh, so to rejuvenate or like to, to, to drag the certain masterpieces out of their, you know, of, of the sphere of their fame and of their you know, confrontational um, celebrity <laughs> that they have, and by simply you know, reproducing them with a more modern medium like photography. And, uh, and imitating, you're waiting for certain imitation or, or um, uh, uh, a narrative relationship with the grouping of the museum visitors to, re, you know, to, to, to suggest a more in, in natural access to them and just take, like walk. You know, for example, I always find you know, many people go to the museum, then they start on the left side, first painting, second painting, or artwork, the next one, so they, the, 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 I, and I know a few people, you know, and, and including myself, I had to teach myself that, you just to go in and, and see what magnetizes me and then spend the time with what I, f I feel attracted to. So, you know, not, maybe that doesn't mm -hmm. answer uh, your question. I, um, I mean, I could maybe say, these photographs that I made in Florence of people who look at the David and it's, uh, I'm thankful for what you said, Glenn, before, because it's indeed the editing is, you know, when I photograph, it's so, uh, when you're a photographer, you have, it's uh, often painful, the many things I see you, that I evaluate, would that be worthwhile? Is that something that, that is worthwhile to, like, to, to heighten or to make, you know, does what I see have importance or not? Yeah, and so of course there's many, 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 many things I've thought and considered and I've seen that I think are not so so important. And this, in the situation in France, I try to, um, you see, okay, I want to photograph those people whose narrative is interesting for me. And when I was there with my assistant for, uh, for six days and being like four hours in the morning, a brief lunchtime, then five hours in the afternoon and looking at the scenery, non-stop every second then of course we, we we said there were stretches where we thought it's just like a white tableau it's like a cloud you know there's people but i i cannot react there's no narrative so i in general i could say all the people i photographed are people that are loved in a in a certain way whose narrative i found somehow uh, inspiring and uh but of course, this is what I thought. It's my interpretation. When I said, when I, a friend of mine who's a museum curator 
when he first saw these pictures, he, he called me and said, this is horrible. <laughs> this is horrible. Look at these ugly people. This is disgusting. How can you, how can you do that? <laughs> these are terrible <laughs> pictures. <laughs> this, is, this is absolutely <laughs> bad. So. Devona. scale of some of his images and also <coughs> that they portray their objectness. They have an almost phenomenological quality and some of them are quite environmental. Given that, um, I know that within MoMA you still very much have the different divisions within the museum, painting, photography, sculpture. Do you think that will hold in the 21st century, those separations that you can well, I certainly don't think those distinctions are meaningful in any other way than as a convenient taxonomy to decide on how to care for material. Uh, so paintings on canvas tend to have certain structural qualities about them that make it easier to classify them together in the same way that photographs on photographic paper uh, have a taxonomy that allows one to care for them together. So in actual fact, uh, what we have been doing over the last 15 years is a gradual blurring of the boundaries, especially in our contemporary galleries where there's absolutely no distinction made between media, uh, photography, painting, sculpture, uh, performance, uh, video, drawing, uh, all occur and are displayed in, in, in the same spaces. And increasingly within our more uh, historic galleries, uh, uh, post-war uh, and before, the distinctions between uh, media are blurred or becoming irrelevant. That said, there are certain media that have their own histories. In other words, you can bring paintings, drawings, um, prints together and largely the artists who made them participated in similar traditions if not the same traditions because often the same artists uh, were active. In the case of particularly architecture and design which is one of our major areas and photography, uh, they're different histories. They're separate histories that if you want to be, if you want to explore those histories, uh, you need to find a way of doing that. Uh, and doing it in a way that is, um, that, I that is fair to the material, that gives it its due. So what I think will happen within short order, years not decades, is that we'll have uh, relatively finite spaces for departmental galleries, uh, especially for uh, media like photography and architecture and design, and then collection galleries that will explore questions uh, that are interesting uh, over the course of the 20th and into the 21st century that will look more at artists rather than what they what medium they chose to work in, uh, and that and I think. That's already at play within the museum and will only become uh, increasingly so. That said, if I could just add a, a point, while Thomas's work doesn't need to be called a photograph or a painting or anything else, Thomas is the maker of pictures that resonate for us. Thomas is also a photographer. His work has a dialogue, I believe, an important dialogue with the history of photography that I think one wouldn't want to lose. We, we as viewers would be the poorer for not understanding Thomas's relationship to a whole history of photography that, that I think is beneficial to be able to also explore. So it's, it's not one or the other, it's both. What, I don't know, Thomas, how, how, what, how do you think about those issues? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I completely agree. I think that, that in the, you know, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, I was going to the museums and saying, Okay, there's only one museum I've ever, I've ever encountered where I saw photography and sculpture and painting in one room. That was the Art Institute of 
Chicago and in no other uh, museum. Of course, I was against that. Uh, and I thought that's really bad. I mean, that has to change. And, uh, and now it's, you know, it's much better still, still, and I agree that, of course, the requirements, uh, you know, in climate and, and, and light and all these things are, are much different between your photography and the other mediums. Uh, uh, and I'm, I, I'm very much against the ghetto of photography. I, I hate, you know, like Paris, ideas like Paris photo, uh, give me the creeps, uh, because they would, no, nobody would make, a, you know, would make a painting fair. Everybody would find that ridiculous. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at the forefront of uh, getting that so, uh, problem solved in a certain way. James. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded actually that I think one of the best books about photography which was <coughs> ever written, uh, in my view, was a, um, a catalogue of an exhibition called Before Photography mm -hmm. by a. Um, is he still the curator of photography at the MoMA, Peter Colassi? No, he just he, retired. Just retired, okay. Well, um, and it was a book about um, early 19th century um, uh, oil sketches, um, including, you know. Actually, there are a couple of wonderful galleries in the Ashmolean yes, now, which include, uh, you know, landscapes by um, from Valenciennes through to Constable, and they essentially established that. I mean, his argument, which I think was very well made, was that a way of seeing was established in early 19th century painting, which actually enabled photography to uh, come into the world. Mm. And in the book, these two kinds of the, the paintings, the sketches and the photographs can be set side by side. I don't know whether they can be set successfully side by side in a gallery, but it would certainly be interesting to see. Mm. I'll give you, can I just uh, riff on that one a little bit more? Because it, 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 one of the most troubling moments I've had at the museum occurred in an exhibition we did in uh, 2000. Uh, it was part of a way of re-exploring our collections. And John Elderfield, who was uh, one of the most brilliant curators, active, um, certainly in the history of our museum, but I think uh, in any museum. John uh, took a Renke Dijkstra uh, photograph of a young figure uh, in a bathing suit and juxtaposed it in the same space with Cezanne's Bather uh, of uh, 1885, one of the most iconic works in our collection. Um, almost identical in size, uh, very similar in subject matter. And then around the corner, uh, because he knew everybody would go absolutely nuts at the <laughs> notion that a photograph and this iconic painting could occupy the same space. Around the corner, John put the source photograph of Cezanne's bather, right? So the bather itself was never a live nude. It was a uh, studio photograph that Cezanne uh, had bought. And what was fascinating to me is that I, I wasn't bothered by it. I thought, what an interesting uh, problem. Two artists dealing with the same subject using a different apparatus, if you wish, to explore it. What was fascinating about it, about it was the people who were most disturbed were the people in the photographic world who found it utterly indefensible that you could locate a photograph next to such an iconic painting. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of issues that still need to be resolved in how we see things. Can I take one more question? Over here. Um, yeah, so, uh, I think Ken was, um, was talking about how how we see your the history of photography. And um, I said, I want to kind of go back to that point. Um, Given that we're talking about different cultures, um, the subject of your work is quite international, but I can see certainly a, a line stretching back from the German tradition to um, Zana um, through the Baptist. Um, where would you position yourself? Do you see yourself as a German photographer or a global photographer? What, does that matter to you at all? Or? <laughs> well, really? it's, it's, it, I, for sure, I'm, yeah, I, I cannot help. I was born in Germany. I grew up there. Yeah, it's sort of, I have a certain, yeah, a certain uh, part of my rucksack, of my backpack, is full of Germanness. That's uh, <laughs> that's for sure, and uh, and it's it's it. You know, I love uh, like systematic thinking. Yeah, you know, and I was, but you know, on the other hand, uh, one of the photographers, 
you know, when I when I started to look at photography history, which was only in, you know when after I met the bachelors before I had no no single clue about any uh, photographer in the photography history was Walker Evans and and so and he's the, he was not American he was American but uh, so yeah uh, of course I like Bach you know I like <laughs> <laughs> yeah I like uh, but you like jazz too I like jazz too, very much yeah. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, John Coltrane or whatever, yeah, uh, but I also love Brahms and Beethoven, <laughs> so, and, I, and I love, yeah, so it's, I'm, I, I'm, let's say it took me a long time to, like, to find, yeah, to, to find a place, it was that, you know, with German history, that took me a long time, and I think that happened only, I think when I was around 42 or 43 years old, before that, I found, found it always uh, troublesome, and, but then, so, since then, I, I I felt I worked a lot. I worked enough on it, you know, for 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 my life, in a certain way. Then like felt a bit more, uh, you know, more at ease with it. But I'm also, of course, I'm very I'm very interested in in in, in very very general questions, which which I feel you know, sort of I feel. You, you, you like you, you know, I, I always think I, I'm a big antenna, you know, for for the personal thing, you know, and and also for just for commu you know, communal uh, shared experiences. And since since we all feel you know, we, we, we filter all, all this stuff through through us. I mean, I remember when I was we went to high school, you, you you would in the morning the news you would hear. Yeah, okay, people, you know, the first step on the moon and stuff like that, but these were rare, you, you rare elements that happened once in a while. And now you open the paper or you, you, you go on the internet, every morning you're just like, Ugh! You're, sort of, you, you, you're showered with, you with all this global uh, information, what your neighbors do, you know, like the, your planet neighbors, like the, the neighbors on your planet. And that's, that's sort of, is often uh, I find stop almost stops you. It's, it's almost paralyzing sometimes. So it's also a recommendation to not do that for a week or so. <laughs> just focus on your own work. Brilliant. Thank you. I'll um, look forward to some German jazz as well, maybe. Um, can I thank you all? I'm, I'm sure we are kind of um, pushing through a, a, an agenda today. But can I thank you all for your for your contribution to Glenn? Yeah. Uh, James and and Thomas um, particularly. Um, I have some thanks as well as ever. Um, both Glenn and James um, mentioned uh, Norman and Elena Foster and their support here, but also um, the program itself, which um, through the Institute of um, Cultural Dialogue and through uh, Lord Weidenfeld, who's supported the program and initiated the program, um, and the support of the Humanities Division here uh, in, in Oxford, particularly for hosting this event. Um, we're kind of speaking very personally uh, through through the museum here, thrilled um, that this event has taken place and um, thrilled that there'll be further events like this as we move to the future. So um, thank you again for your contributions. And um, I believe there's another panel about to convene in these various spaces after a five-minute refreshment break. Thank you. Thank you.